Um, thank you very much, uh, everyone. It's really nice to have you all here with us today. Uh, we are here for a, a webinar on uh, archaeological imaging techniques uh, from Dr. Phil Cox from Gloucestershire Archaeology. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Phil, uh, for uh, um, being our speaker today. It will be really, really good and really, really interesting. I'm really looking forward to it. And the way we usually run, um, we're going to give um, Dr. Phil the time to run through his presentation for as long as you need, Dr. Phil. And after that, um, we can go for Q&A, so questions uh, and that the audience might have uh, on Zoom. Feel free to either drop your question in the chat or open your mic once um, the presentation is finished. Um, Phil, it's uh, all, uh, so the floor is all yours now. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to, to talk to you this evening. It's uh, slightly da daunting talking to a, a computer society about archaeology, but I shall do my, my best to, uh, to keep you interested. Um, so, um, yes, so I'm going to be talking this evening in fairly brief terms about um, various imaging techniques that you can use in, in archaeology um some of, with with some examples of things that i've done or or that other people have uh, done um around around gloucestershire um since that's where i'm based and uh, where my interest lies so um so um as uh, as Thiago said we are uh, gloucestershire archaeology which is the um amateur archaeology organization for gloucestershire um we're based between predominantly Cheltenham and Gloucester, but we have members all over Gloucestershire. And, and thanks to our Zoom lectures over the last couple of years, we've got quite a few members from further afield, even from uh, even from the United States. So uh, uh, it's uh, wonderful what technology can do uh, in extending our, our reach uh, beyond uh, beyond the borders of Gloucestershire. Anyway, moving on. Um, so the first thing really to ask is what is archaeology? We all have, I'm sure, some idea about um, what, what archaeologists do, and I just pulled a few uh, definitions off of the internet, um, which sort of give us a, a flavour of what, um, what we're seen as. Uh, so, so archaeology, according to Wikipedia, is the study of human activity through the recovery and analysis of material culture. To me, that sounds like things, finding things, things you can handle. Um, so it sort of sounds like you've got to recover them by um by potentially uh digging them up from the ground and uh and, and then and then sorting and working out what they are uh, the society for american archaeology uh, is fairly similar on that it says the study of the ancient and recent human past through material remains so again talking about things uh, and sounds like think remains sound like things that you handle so um um definitely sounds like you need to dig um the Encyclopedia of Global Archaeology is another one I found, which just says it's the study of past peoples and culture. And that is obviously amazingly broad and, and pretty much covers anything. So um, anything from the past. So, oops, missed a slide, sorry. So to be an archaeologist, do you have to dig holes? Well, the answer, as you will have seen from my next slide, is undoubtedly no. There are lots of ways of studying archaeological sites um, without doing any excavation. And so this is really where we're looking at archaeological sites within the landscape, whether they be um, the remains of buildings or they be under, underground um, remains. Um, but we can, we can look at those without having to dig them up, which means that we don't have to destroy them because once you dig something up, you basically destroy it and it's not there for somebody else to go and look at later on. The great thing about these um, non-excavation methods is that they're accessible to um, anybody, really. You don't have to firstly have a degree in archaeology. You don't have to be able to go to an archaeological site to do many of them. Um, so people from all, all walks of life can access um, these techniques. And the other good thing is that you can use these techniques on important sites, sort of scheduled ancient monuments, because again, you're not interfering with them. All you're all you're doing is is documenting what's there and and trying to understand what's going on around them. So, um, so yes, yeah, so so no, you don't have to dig holes to be an archaeologist. We call this non-invasive archaeology, and there are various strands to it. 
Um, there's, for start, what we call remote sensing or aerial imaging, um, both aerial photography of one form or another, uh, but also uh, LIDAR scanning, which will, again, both of which I'll come on to in a moment. Um, then there are geophysical surveys. So these are surveys on the ground, uh, looking to see what's beneath the ground using various physical properties that are of, of the ground itself and what's, what's within it. So we can either look at resistivity or earth resistance. We can look at the magnetic field using magnetometry, or we can use radar as you would um, under the sea or in the sky. You can also look beneath the ground with, with a radar device. And finally, you can survey these days rather than having to take tape measures and uh, uh, and uh, theodolites and to, to survey a site. We can now do much with uh, with a high resolution GPS, that's a global positioning system type device for use for surveying. Uh, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those um, as we go along. So the oldest of these techniques is, is aerial photography. In fact, it was first developed after World War One, when the, um, the the reconnaissance pilots flying over the trenches realized that they, when they took their photos, they were also seeing other things. They were seeing ruined buildings. They were seeing archaeological sites. And and uh, the pioneer of this this um, mode of looking at archaeology is someone called O. G. S. Crawford, and he really started um, aerial photography as part of archaeology. In fact, he became the first archaeological officer of the Ordnance Survey, and he worked in the 1920s and 30s onwards. Um, it's good for looking at things which stand above the ground, what we call earthworks. Um, to get really good photographs, there's a great deal of skill. It's not literally a matter of flying over on any given day, snapping a few pictures. Uh, uh, if you really want to get the best information to pick up the subtlest of changes, you've got to judge um, the angle at which you take your picture. You need to Let's take account of the lighting at the time. Uh, ideally, you want the, the sun low in the sky so that it highlights any lumps and bumps. Um, and of course, the time of year can be useful as well. Winter is often a nice time to take aerial photos because if you've got snow on the ground, um, the uh, contrast between the shadows and the light can be particularly striking. You can get some amazing photographs. However, more recently, um, Crop marks and parch marks um, have made uh, the national press. Um, these are photographs taken of the ground during, usually during periods um, of drought, um, where you get differential drying of deeper and thinner layers in the soil. So if you have a ditch, for example, that um, will hold water longer than, than an area of thinner soil. So that can stand out as, as, a, as a parch mark, at least as of the drier area stands out as a parch mark. But also the greater moisture in the soil um, allows the crops um, growing over that um, over that ditch to grow better than than their surrounding areas, and so you can see what are called crop marks, sort of green lines. Uh, as I say, this is very weather dependent. You can really only look see crop marks in times of, of drought, but whenever there's a good drought. Um, the um, the uh, English Heritage team, they have their own aerial mapping team that's up flying either in planes or using drones, recording things. And it's every year that they do it, they find lots of new sites that weren't, that weren't known about. And so the pictures here, firstly, we've got Bella's Nap, a, a Neolithic long barrow photographed. And this is, this is from the English Heritage website, uh, showing it rather, rather beautifully. Uh, the Cotswold Edge is just here. Um, so, so this is um, an upstanding earthwork. Whereas in the lower picture, you can see an enclosure outlined here, of more or less rectangular enclosure, which contains some circles. And these look as though they're probably um, Bronze Age round barrows that have been flattened by the plough, but because of the ditch around the barrow, they still stand out. Um, as uh, as crop marks uh, and say so these new these things turn up and also you can um, can go on existing um, aerial photographs you can go onto the English Heritage website for example and um, see lots of aerial photos and people commonly pick up new things that hadn't been noticed before by uh, by reviewing these old uh, these old aerial photographs um, nowadays with the advent of drones. Um, aerial photography is opened up to pretty well anybody who's got access to a drone uh, and you can uh, 
um, fly over sites and take pictures. Um, obviously, you need the appropriate clearance if you've got a, a, a big enough drone. The great thing with drones is also they've now been equipped with various types of cameras. So not only um, taking pictures in the in the visible spectrum, but also looking for infrared or other multispectral images, and those can show up even more information um, um, than you would get by uh, by just photographing with uh, um, in the visible spectrum. So uh, it's something that, whilst it is the oldest. Um, area of um, of uh, aerial archaeology. It's also still very active, uh, and this just just an example of um, part of the uh, English Heritage National Mapping Program um, across the Cotswold Hills, where a team reviewed all of the aerial photographs across um, across the Cotswold Hills, looking for earthworks, and then transferred them onto uh, onto maps so they could be seen and. Um, if you see my here, this is the this is the village of Farmington in Gloucestershire, which the village is here. But once upon a time, it was substantially larger because you can see lots of earthworks around the periphery of the village, and these have all been mapped onto uh, here. And there's some more earthworks down here, which is just off the uh, off the picture. So so uh, yes, can give us a lot of lot of new information. Um, and this this was only fairly recent. This was uh, this was published in 2011. Um, and Gloucester also has its own famous aerial photographer, um, a gentleman uh, called Harold Wingham, uh, who was born in 1924, um, uh, but uh, and during the uh, Second World War was a wireless operator, was training to be a wireless operator. Um, after the end of the war, he took up aerial photography. Um, he was largely self-funded. He managed to beg and borrow some cameras uh, and amassed a huge collection of aerial photographs. He was also a founder member of our society, which was originally known as GADARG or the Gloucester and District Archaeological Research Group. Um, we've now gone for the much punchier uh, name of um, Glossark, um, but uh, it's the same organisation. Um, and his photo collection is available on the uh, Historic England website. In fact, there's a whole section about him. Um, and he died recently, um, aged 97. Um, uh, and these are some pictures from his archive. Uh, on the left here, we've got Cleve Common, uh, the hill fort up on the edge of the, the Cotswold Escarpment. Nice and low view showing the banks rather beautifully. And on the right, some earthworks at Cassie, uh, at Cassie Compton, where again, you can see uh, with the lighting having got just right, with low, you can see the sun's very low, it's picking out these, these faint earthworks, which are probably, again, some settlement. Oops, sorry, I've gone. Uh, and and the map in the middle shows the extent. Sorry, I've gone again. The uh, the map in the middle shows the extent of his um, uh, of his photography. So really, throughout much of the the West Midlands and also down in Devon and Cornwall. So, and these pictures, as I say, are available on the English Heritage web, website if you're minded to go and and look at them. Uh, some wonderful images. So right. So next thing um, is lidar. Um, LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. Um, it's a, um, a technique where an airborne laser is used to scan the ground surface um, located very carefully by um, GPS coordinates. So it's very precisely located. The advantage of this over aerial photography is that the laser can actually penetrate through the vegetation. So it can see through the trees uh, and you get a reflected image from the ground surface as well as from the top of the trees. Um, so if you just look at the ground surface images, you can find all sorts of things hidden underneath vegetation. Um, the coverage of LIDAR is still not complete across the UK, um, but, but it's increasing and there is a, um, there is a, a plan to cover the whole co country with, with LIDAR imaging, uh, which is freely available through uh, the DEFRA website. Uh, using the link as you can see there. So you can choose your area of interest and download the tiles um, of, of LIDAR data. Um, at the moment, the DEFRA data is at one or two meter resolution, but that still shows a lot of, a lot of um, resolution, a lot of information uh, on uh, things that are maybe quite subtly um, above or, or dipping below the, the, the natural ground surface. 
um, and you download the data as a series of points, um, which are then processed uh, to produce an image of the site. Um, in fact, GlossArt were quite early adopters of, of LiDAR, um, a project called Seeing Through the Trees in the um, late noughties, in, which was published in 29 and 10, was uh, ground surveys relating to a, a large study funded by the Cranham Local History Society of the uh, of, of part of the Cotswold Edge. Um, and there were eight sites identified on this LIDAR survey, um, which Glossark investigated. Some of them turned out to be modern features, but others were really were quite interesting. Um, for example, at the top here, this is a, a Bronze Age, uh, I'm sorry, now this is a Neolithic round bow, which is most unusual because most Neolithic bow bowers are long bowers, but this is a Neolithic um, round barrow. Here is the remains of a, nine, of a, a, sorry, a 17th century mill, um, uh, which was, was little known of. And then these trenches were thought possibly to be uh, Civil War um, activity. These were, this was at Cranham um, above Painswick. Um, but on further investigation, most of them were thought to be modern, uh, but there was at least one which was possibly a breastwork for the uh, um, for the soldiers. Uh, anyway, so so this was uh, this was a study that we um, we did some years ago. Um, more recently, we used LIDAR to look at um, um, a site which is of some interest. This is Churchdown Hill just outside Gloucester, and there's been quite a lot of debate about what there was on the top of the hill, whether there was an Iron Age settlement there or not. Um, and the site, as you can see from this LIDAR image here, it's been very badly damaged. For start, there were three reservoirs planted in the top of it, which were put in in the 1960s. Before that, they'd been quarrying both in the medieval period and then in the 19th and 18th centuries. Um, so a lot of damage, however, um, when you go up there, you can see there are a series of banks around the edge of the hilltop, and nobody really knew quite what those were. There was a small excavation by uh, an archaeologist called Henry Hurst, who was a county archaeologist, um, which was undertaken in 1972 through one of these banks when they put a, a, a pipe through them. Uh, and it was clear that this was a man-made bank, uh, but there's very little evidence other than the fact that it was man-made that came out of that excavation. Um, a couple of bits of Iron Age pottery were found when the reservoirs were being dug, but there hadn't been much else. So we um, took this LIDAR, which um, was highlighted to, to me um, in 2020, uh, and used uh, it to assess this hill fort. And, and you can see here around the edge, um, these banks run certainly all around this quadrant of the, of the top of the hill, and again around here, there's a terrace here, which is a, a, a walk that people often do, and a little bit more bank there. And we think that that is very much in support of this uh, site having been a defensive site, uh, probably in the Iron Age. Uh, so there's certainly no other evidence of banks being built anywhere. And it would fit with the, the, the presence of many of these hillfalls along the edge of the Cotswolds, uh, all, many of which are within view of, of the top of Church downhill, so we think it's probably part of that um, part of uh, uh, of that series of hill forts. And then, even more recently, um, some more lidar was was brought to our attention. I don't know how many of you are aware, but um, and obviously it's very topical this week as Cheltenham races are on. Um, the original Cheltenham race course was up on the top of Cleve Common, uh, near to where the radio masts are now. If you know the uh, if you know the common. And racing took place there between about 18, 1819 and 1839, possibly into the early 1840s. Um, and the first grandstand, which is in fact this one on the uh, on the, the um, plan at the top, sorry, I keep moving pages, um, was, um, was actually burnt down in 1829. And the story is that um, Dean Close of uh, Dean Close School fame, uh, a local uh, rather noisy preacher uh, was railing against the uh, the evils of horse racing and uh, drinking and gambling that went with it and his followers went up in in one night and burnt the grandstand down um, so anyway a second grandstand was built in the early 1830s and that survived till the end of racing in the early 1840s when it was pulled down and apparently the uh, 
the uh, the rubble uh, the, and everything from the grandstand was sold for scrap. Um, anyway, we we weren't too. No one's really been too sure where this um, this grandstand was. Um, but lidar discovered recently shows this structure and this maps to this sort of area here. Um, when you if you put it on to uh, OS mapping, um, so we thought this is something there. There's clearly um, a building there. When you go up onto the common, though, you, this is quite prominent. But on the common, there's a slight mound, and this is some of our members when we went up to do some further surveying, um, and you can just about make out a, a slight rise in the ground there, though much less obvious than this. Um, LiDAR image. So, so LiDAR certainly is, again, something you can do uh, from your armchair um, with, uh, if you have a site of interest, you can download it and uh, process it and end up with an image and, and, and look around the area to see what you can see. Okay, so that's aerial imaging. Um, next, uh, moving on to what we can do to see beneath the surface, surface without, without digging it. And as I mentioned earlier, there are three different methods that are common in use. There are one or two others that can be used as well, but these are the, these are the common ones. So resistivity, magnetometry, and ground penetrating radar. So survey, surveying using a resistivity um, probe um, basically measures the resistivity of the soil um, between two probes, uh, which are going over the area of interest, and a second pair of probes, which have to be at least 15 meters away. Um, so the probes create a, um, a current in the ground through the soil and the, the sensor probes um, kind of pick up, measure the, the resistance between the, uh, between the probes. Um, this, of course, is, this is dependent on the amount of moisture in the soil. So wetter soil is, has less resistance and things that have uh, less water in them are, have higher resistance. It can see about a meter beneath the soil um, if you've got your probes about half a meter apart, which is the, the standard uh, distance that's used. If you put them further apart, you can see deeper, but it becomes much more difficult to do the um, to do the surveying. Um, it's particularly good at seeing, well, it can see ditches because the resistance in a ditch is, which is generally wetter, uh, is lower resistance. So you may pick up ditches, but it's especially good at seeing um, wall foundations, for example, because of the, the stonework has a much higher resistance than the surrounding soil. And so um, um, it picks up as a, as a, as a, a positive signal. Um, you, use, you can use either two probes or you can use multi-probe arrays. If you're um, poor like Glossark, you have a device such as this, and this is our resistivity meter. And uh, you can see the two probes on the bottom connected to a little box of tricks on the top. And then the wire goes off into the distance to the uh, to the uh, remote probes, um, and what we do is lay out twenty meter grids and measure every meter. So we get, we end up with twenty by twenty or four hundred points from our our grid. Um, this data is then downloaded into analysis software such as GeoPlot or, or, or Snuffler. Uh, GeoPlot's expensive, Snuffler's free, so I tend to use use Snuffler. Uh, and this converts those readings and their coordinates into um, a grid with a, a grayscale image on it. Um, with a bit of uh, filtering, a bit of um, interpolation, you can often produce a, a very nice sharp image of, of what's under, under the ground. So here's a couple of projects that, that we've done with Glossart. This was the top one is the hill fort on Cleve Common that you saw in the aerial photograph. Uh, this we surveyed um, six or seven years ago, um, and you can see a number of features. This is this was 36 20 meter grids, um, which were all assembled together to get this to get this image. And you can see here a, a very bright circle, which is in fact a, a, a post medieval tree ring where people planted trees on the edge of the escarpment. Uh, but also within there, you can see some other details. We can certainly see. The uh, footpath, so my mouse has disappeared. Here we go. The footpath going through there, another one through there, but also some outlines, which are probably structures um, from when the hill fort was being used uh, back in the Iron Age. Um, so, yes, definitely some, uh, some features there. 
Um, this site has never been excavated, so there's very little known about the interior of it. So we've managed to add something to that, um, that information and you'll see some more images in a moment. Then the grandstand on, on Cleve Common for the race course is, we, we surveyed that just before Christmas uh, and surveying over that site, which is what we're doing in this picture here, gave us this rather beautiful image at the bottom and you can clearly see the outline of, of, a, of a building, which we believe to be the second of the grandstands based on its position, um, you doing some work on, on mapping. Um, and it appears to have stone foundations, although it was demolished, the foundations were obviously left behind. And we're doing some more work up there um, in the near future. So we're trying to get, to get more information about this whole area. Um, so yes, uh, resistivity can show us some very interesting things. The second technique is, is magnetometry. Um, as the name suggests, it measures very small uh, variations in the Earth's magnetic field caused by uh, things under the ground. Uh, these variations are in the nano Tesla range. So it's, these are it's an exceptionally sensitive uh, instrument that we that we use. It's the principle is basically if the magnetic field is is the long arrows in this um, this image here. If something is within it, it's something that has a different magnetic field, it will perturb that um, magnetic field and you'll be able to detect that with the, with the magnetometer. Um, it's particularly good for finding ditches. The reason for that is that the natural magnetism of the soil is disturbed when the ditch is dug. And as uh, material washes back into the ditch, the orientation of the magnetic field um, of the material washed in is different to the surrounding um, field, the surrounding soil, and so that shows up as a, as a signal. The other thing that shows up particularly well are sites of burning, uh, because when you um, heat something to a high temperature and then let it cool, it will, um, the, 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 part of the magnetic particles in it will all align with the Earth's magnetic field, which will be different to the surrounding area, which is, is more of a jumble, so um, sites of burning also stand out um, well within um, um, by, by magnetometry. Anything, of course, that's magnetizable, like um, a piece of iron, a tin can or something like that will also show up. Um, um, and it's actually less good at identifying uh, buildings. So the foundations tend not to show up. So they may do, but it's, it's less sensitive for picking up uh, building foundations. Um, and also not too good at finding um, burials under the ground because um, the soil is sort of, is dug up and thrown straight back. It doesn't sort of settle naturally, and, and that seems to, to hide the signal. Uh, there are various types of instrument that you can use, and most people use something called a flux gate magnetometer, which varies, which measures the variation in the magnetic field along the um, the um, the coil within the device. And if you put two coils together, you've got what's called a gradiometer because it measures the gradient of the change between the two um, between the two probes. Uh, and here's me holding a um, a, a magnetometer. This is a, a, a large two pole um, two probe one. Or this is on Cleve Hill. It has the advantage over resistivity that it's substantially quicker because you walk continuously up and down through your grids. You don't have to keep stopping and probing the ground as you do with, with resistivity. It's much quicker, so you can cover much greater areas in a day. However, it is quite fiddly to use. Um, you have to maintain a constant height of the probes above the ground. You have to walk at a steady pace. Uh, because the device is recording so many recordings per second so if you're not walking at a steady pace you get skewing of the of the readings and you have to keep the probe vertical within the earth's magnetic field so it's a bit of a fiddle uh, and of course if you if you were wearing magnetic material that would interfere as well so you have to make sure that when you get dressed in the morning you wear things that are, are non-magnetic um, and you have to keep things like the ends of metal ends of tapes and things away from from the uh, the grid. So it's a bit of a fiddle. However, it gives you more points. It gives you four points from, per meter in your one meter uh, runs across your grid. But and again, it produces a series of coordinates and a series of readings, and these are processed in in one of a, a very variety of um, software packages uh, to produce an image. Again, the processing is a bit more fiddly than, than resistivity. It generally requires a bit more filtering, but you can end up with some very nice images. Uh, and this one at the bottom here is actually I've taken from 
um, Tony Roberts uh, Archeoscan website, um, which shows within this field, well, there's a big stripe across the middle of it. That's probably a, um, a pipe that's been put across the field. But on either side of, of that pipe, you can see the outlines of ditches. Uh, and there's clearly been a lot of activity in this field. And, and as it turned out, when um, when Archeoscan went there to do their excavation, found they found a very interesting Roman settlement there. Um, so uh, so can give you great information, but a lot of work, as you can see, each of these squares is a 20 meter square. So this has been a vast area that's been been surveyed. On a smaller scale, we also did magnetometry on the Cleve Cloud Hill Fort up on Cleve Common. Um, this doesn't really, it doesn't show ditches, but it does show a lot of dark spots, which we think are many of which are probably um, storage pits within the hill fort, which is a common activity within these hill forts. Again, these were not known about before we went up there. There are one or two other linear features. We don't know what they those are. I'm afraid the only way we would get to find out is to excavate. So sometimes you do have to go and excavate. Um, and we'll never get permission because this is a this is a scheduled ancient monument. So we will we're most unlikely to be allowed to go and dig there. But we certainly added to the sum of, of knowledge. Uh, and then this is another site that we surveyed with that with magnetometry fairly recently. Uh, again, not vast amounts, but there is there appears to be some sort of ditch here, something here and something here. And we are engaged in uh, a program of excavation at this site where we know there was once a Roman villa. Um, so we are we are engaged in we will be going back there next year to do some more excavation to try and work out what's going on. But these um, images can help us to place where we where we are most likely to find something when we dig. OK, then the final way of looking beneath the ground is ground penetrating radar. This is a more modern technique. It's been around probably for 15 or 20 years now, but it's become much more refined in, in recent years. And like any radar device, it's uh, sending radio waves into the ground and picking up their um, return, timing their return, but with a, with a receiver. Um, and the transmitter and receiver are mounted on a trolley of some sort, which is either pushed or dragged over a 20 meter grid. Uh, and the great advantage of the modern devices is, is that um, you can see what you're doing in real time as you walk up and down, you get it, you can see the signal being received and you can spot where there may be something. And at the end of each grid, you can even look at, at the whole grid in, in, uh, in uh, sort of immediately. So you get instant gratification um, at the end of the uh, at the end of each grid and start to build up a picture in your head before you assemble all the grids together. It's particularly good for picking up interfaces between things of differing relic, uh, reflectivity. For example, the foundations of a building uh, within a soil matrix or the edge of a ditch uh, cut into, into bedrock. Uh, so very good for those sorts of things. And it has much greater penetration than either magnetometry or resistivity. So you can see down to about two and a half meters in depth. Although to be honest, that not very often you have to go that deep for the sort of things that, uh, that we're looking for. The downside is though, this is a very expensive piece of kit. You're looking at maybe 30,000 pounds to buy one. So it's not within the reach of um, the average individual or the uh, average local archeology span society. So if you get to use one, you have to beg it from, uh, from somebody who owns one, a university or a commercial company. And this, so this is the sort of thing. This is um, a gentleman walking up and down within a graveyard and the device is within this trolley. And you can see he's got a, a computer uh, there, which is on a monitor that he can see what's going on. And when he's walking up and down, this is what he will see, a load of lines, um, but you can see a series of parabolas um, within that signal. And the parabolas are uh, reflections from edges, which give us, uh, which tell you that there is something reflective down there. And when each of the, um, the, um, the, the these transects, are put together and then sliced horizontally, you can then cut down through the feature. And this is actually a crypt. Um, so this is, um, uh, you, so you can see quite amazing detail within these, uh, within beneath the ground. Um, this is some work that I was involved with. Uh, this was um, the University of Worcester 
uh, where I was a student a few years ago. Um, the university dig had for a number of years been um, on the hills around the village of Priddy on the Mendips in Somerset, where there is um, a, a very quite extensive prehistoric landscape. Uh, there are many Bronze Age round barrows along the edge along the tops of the hills. There are some Neolithic earthworks and ditches um, as well, uh, as well as Iron Age and Roman um, things there as well. Um, the first thing that was picked up, this was actually originally picked up by um, magnetometry. There was certainly there was something here, but the detail was was not clear. Um, towards the edge of a field, um, there were some some dots and they weren't quite sure what they were so we, we took the ground penetrating radar and in these grids you can see dark splodges the, the lighter areas of the bedrock because it's rather like the Cotswold Hills it's limestone there's very thin soil on top of the uh, on top of the bedrock so we're seeing bedrock all around but within it there are these circles uh, and these are pits cut, cut, sorry, keeps jumping, um, pits cut into the bedrock um, and uh, obviously filled with soil. Um, if you um, turn that in, if you turn that into a, um, a sort of graphic, you can see at the bottom a circle of, I think it's 12 pits with a couple of outlying pits, which may mark the entrance to this circle. And it, it's thought that uh, this pit circle was originally a Neolithic timber circle. Um, uh, so a circle of large tree trunks, um, a bit like Stonehenge, but made out of, uh, made out of wood. Um, and it's the only one known on, on the Mendips and adds another piece of the jigsaw to the, to the Neolithic landscape on, on the Mendips. The other feature in the same field, amazingly, uh, was this, uh, and this had also been picked up in in relatively low resolution uh, using using uh, magnetometry by the local archaeology society, um, and it appeared to be a square feature within this field. Well, we walked the ground penetrating radar over quite a large area around where we thought this um, this thing was, and these are the images that we obtained, and you can see here a square. And another square inside it, and this is uh, the uh, the hallmark of a uh, Romano-British temple, uh, and this was completely unknown prior to our um, prior to our uh, work. So the inner square is the shrine of the temple. The outer square again is a stone-built foundation. Uh, is what's called the ambulatory, where the priest would uh, appear outside of the of the shrine. It looks as though there could be some steps here as well. And then further out, you can see a dark line running around here and down to here. Um, and this is called the Temenos ditch. This is the ditch that sort of marks the outer boundary of the uh, uh, of the temple site. So the, probably the public would be allowed within the Temenos, inside the Temenos ditch, but wouldn't be allowed to go into the, the temple. Um, so this is a, a, a new finding um, and so it's shown rather beautifully by the by the ground penetrating radar and um, had Worcester University's archaeology department not been closed by the university a couple of years ago, we would have gone back there to dig this and so it's still waiting there for somebody to go and uh, go and excavate and, and see what, uh, uh, what's left of it. Okay, so that's looking beneath the ground. The last technique I'm just going to mention very briefly is um, GPS, Global Positioning System Based Topographic Survey. Um, it allows us to survey earthworks using a very sensitive, very accurate um, GPS device as shown here. Uh, this is actually on the uh, hill fort at Cleve Common. And uh, because it's centimetre accurate both um, horizontally and vertically, you can get a, um, a set of coordinates very quickly and accurately. Uh, and those coordinates, because it's taken with the GPS device, also georeferenced, so you can put them on top of mapping very, very easily. Um, it's much simpler than the old way of, of surveying, which required tapes and theodolites and, uh, uh, and all sorts. Uh, instead, you can do it this very quickly, and it's particularly useful if you want to survey something upstanding, an upstanding earthwork where the LIDAR coverage hasn't got there yet. 
And so, for example, this is another site on, on Cleave Common called The Ring. Um, and what you do is you record a large number of points with your, uh, with your GPS, um, import them into a GIS software, and with that, it, it can turn those points into this three-dimensional model of the, of the site. And you can see here the ditch, uh, a bank in front of it. This is rising up behind it, a bank rising behind it, uh, a little platform here. So lots of things that could be interesting to go and, uh, go and investigate. And if you wish to, you can put them onto aerial photographs and see them in 3D. And you can also cut sections across them so you can see what the, the profile of the, of the site is. And this is quite interesting because the hill slope is here and you can see quite clearly that that, um, that feature has been dug into the, into the um, side of the hill rather than placed on top of it. So um, again, quite nice, quite interesting and, and, um, and, and say reasonably rapid way of, of surveying. So that's about, um, about all I have to say about uh, um, archaeology and um, just to say that uh, I hope I've shown you that archaeology is definitely not all about digging holes and and washing bits of pottery. Um, there, if you go down the remote sensing route, route using aerial photographs and lidar, you can literally do archaeology from your armchair, providing you've got a computer on your lap at the time. Um, with geophysical surveying, you can see beneath the soil without a spade. It's certainly a lot less backbreaking than uh, uh, than digging. Um, holes, uh, so you can get a lot of information um, without disturbing the ground. And if you use the GPS-based topographic survey approach, you can record earthworks without um, having to use a tape measure. If you tie that up with um, global in information system software or GIS software, you can put all of those things together along with historic mapping and modern mapping, you can create digital models, you can take measurements, you can compare them to, uh, to other sites. Um, so again, it's another armchair technique for doing all sorts of interesting archaeology. But um, as, I, as I said at the bottom, there, it's a topic, that's a topic for another day. So um, finally, just to say a few thank yous, I'd like to thank um, particularly Mike Millward and Les Comtes of Gloss Ark, um, who were very much involved in, in setting up the work on Cleve Hill, um, but also the volunteers from Glossark who, uh, who um, came along on wet and windy days and uh, walked up and down doing some of the surveying. Um, like um, thank Dr. Tim Copeland and David Aldred, who were um, people who suggested some of the sites that we looked at on the common. And then also Jody Lewis, Dr. Jody Lewis and David Mullin and Dr. Andrew Ho and all of whom were uh, staff of the former archaeology department at Worcester University who were fantastic teachers and also led the uh, the investigations down at, at Pretty. So thank you to them. And then finally to the conservators of uh, Cleve Common and English Heritage who gave us the permits to do the work on, on Cleve Common. So um, that's it and, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Phil, for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, we can now open up the floor for questions, and we already have a question from Graham uh, Copeland. How do you decide which imaging technique to use when you are planning an archaeological survey? Okay, yes. Um, well, partly depends on the conditions. Um, so, um, for example, um, you need a degree of ground moisture to do resistivity not if it's too wet or it's too dry then it's not too useful but also it's more about what you're looking for and also partly what equipment you've got available magnetometry and, and resistivity are both quite useful so resistivity is better if you're looking for the foundations of a building because of the the way way it works um, the resistance is is that much higher if you're looking to map out a landscape as you saw in the um image from uh, of, of tony roberts that huge site that um he'd surveyed using the magnetometry where you probably it would take you forever to do that with um with resistivity certainly using the sort of equipment that that we have um but the commercial companies will will choose which one they use they can do much larger areas because they often have machines with multiple probes etc so it can be faster um 
but um, resistivity is particularly easy for amateur groups to use uh, and gives us quite a lot of information. Say um, magnetometry is a bit more difficult, um, although we do now possess a, our own magnetometer and we're getting getting to grips with that and have done some surveying with it. Um, Ground penetrating radar will be lovely to use in all sorts of sites, but we don't have thirty thousand pounds, so it's, it's finances also come into into the into the decision. So, uh, um, but um, yeah, magnetometry and resistivity they have their sort of they have their sort of pros and cons, and um, it's uh, uh, say well, if we're looking to survey a large area for, for, for ditches, then we'd use the magnetometer, and if it's um, looking for buildings then we probably use the resistivity i hope that's sort of reasonably not too not too waffly brilliant thank you very much phil um so the floor is open if anyone have any questions feel free to open up the mic or, or drop in the chat feel free to ask any questions um, if you want to divide the chat or um, the microphone um in, in the meantime phil i think i have a question with regards to uh computing um, um and, and and things that you know computer science can help in this area as well what are your thoughts on augmented reality and virtual reality and a combination with um, those archaeological imagings um how do you see they working together um there's been quite a bit of uh, or an increasing amount of, um, of um, sort of AI type work and so it's augmented reality type work. There were some projects um, looking at some of the, the, the chambered tombs in, in Scotland have taken a photogrammetry approach, um, having created um, their, their sort of 3D model of the inside of, of, of these some of these chambered tombs and then using augmented reality to allow you to walk through it with a with a VR on and uh, explore um explore the site that way which is so I think for 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 presenting sites to to the public uh, they're very useful they also they also can be very I mean for example the photogrammetry methods are pick up amazing detail much more than perhaps you would necessarily see with the with the naked eye for example again in in some of the chambered tombs there is um rock art scratched onto the uh onto the stones inside and it's quite difficult to 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 record that any other way but if you went by using photogrammetry you can often see much more detail and it throws up much more um and subtle features that you might not uh, you would you probably wouldn't otherwise um otherwise see using using just uh, if you're in there with the torch so um yeah so that sort of thing is is very useful um flyovers of sites are quite uh, commonly made now as now as well if you've got to uh, see some of the great sites in the world but also some of the uh, some of sort of smaller things you know, more, more national sites have been you know they've been brought into you have these sort of flyovers that you can do and sort of fly through them and explore them with using using augmented reality. So yeah, it's quite interesting. And you can obviously put other things in like sounds and all sorts to, to really get the get the get the feel of the places. So, so I think in those sort of points, those ways are good. I mean, um GIS is is an amazing tool. That's not really augmented reality, but that's certainly where computing interacts and of all the processing that we do of all of the um uh, uh, of all of the data we 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 use is all done with uh, uh is varying levels of some fairly simple software some more complex but uh, GIS is, is amazing for uh, both processing and examining these sort of things but also looking at wider landscapes and mapping where for example all the hill forts are along the Cotswold edge and how they relate to one another and, and all those sorts of so amazing stuff you can do now which was would have been ex exceptionally laborious if you were doing it on a on a paper map you know so it's um Brilliant. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, we have a couple of more questions on the chat. So Chris is asking, what is the size of the data that these instruments produce and how long does it take to process and render? Yes, well, <laughs> depend. The, the resistivity files, a 20 meter grid is, I think I what I downloaded a couple this evening, I think they were 2 KB. They're tiny files because they are basically a set of coordinates 400 set 400 coordinates and 
uh, so x and y coordinates and um and um just a uh, uh, and then a reading for them when you're looking at ground penetrating radar then because you're looking at much larger files even so the 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 machine itself will will process and pr give you a preliminary Im image within a few minutes uh where if you do a 20 meter grid with maybe half meter strips across it um it will put all of that together for you within a few minutes and you can then slice through it at, at sort of very sort of five centimeter um sort of slices through it and, and see it develop so that's pretty powerful lidar um likewise is a is a fair they're fairly large files uh, but rendering you tend to render them in um in the gis package to produce the 3d models that's moments to do it you know within within a, a few seconds so you're not looking at at enormous files obviously the bigger the site the more data you've got then yes it will take a bit longer but um actually uh, your your so a fairly standard laptop is perfectly um capable of doing any of those um any any of those things that i've shown that they were all done on my laptop so there's which uh, there's nothing sort of uh, uh particularly uh sort of massive about them they're quite uh uh, quite accessible to anyone who fancies having a go really it's, it's brilliant um thank you we also have a question from diana on, on the plans of um pretty uh what were the large dark and light uh features please uh let's have a look where were we uh let me go back oh so i've probably got, I've gone the wrong way let's, there we go let's go back to pretty okay let me just so i can see um um was it on was it on the previous one i don't know which one um diana was talking about oh is it, is it, no. right these this was an area of quarrying um here and uh possibly here as well so it was lucky that this was was preserved so um um and this what we we thought we were hoping this was going to be something really exciting it just did just turn out to be uh, some rock that was very close to the surface but um um the this was probably uh the, the dark area in the top right hand corner was probably um uh, probably an area of, of previous quarrying maybe neolithic quarrying quite possibly so um, um around the uh, ditch and again here we've got we don't know what some of that that's the the circle we excavated so we know what was there we actually don't know what was uh, what what for example this is this looks terribly interesting it looks like there might be something we did speculate it could be a statue or something under the ground but until we go till someone goes back and excavate <laughs> we will never know but um certainly looks like something interesting uh and the rest of it i think is just um just the uh, the bedrock but um yes yeah, so, but um certainly quite um some some interesting stuff everyone was everyone champing at the bit to try and get back down there but um who knows whether we ever will so it's uh it's a great shame but, uh... brilliant um i think it's a comment from uh teague uh campbell moore uh uk natural resources gpr data set has hit the exabyte i think just a comment i guess Followed with GPR data is massive, and we tend to have to wait for computing to catch up to use it, rather than the resolution of the radar data being the issue. Uh, I think it's more of a comment. I don't know if you want to comment on that, a few. Um, yes, I don't know. I mean, we've. Um, I don't. It may depend on the. I mean, this is, and this is quite a large site. I forget how many twenty meter grids. This is right. I think it's about six by about eight and about eight by six, so about 40 or 30, 40 grids. Um, and this process quite quite easily this with the with certainly with the software that um was this was the this was using um uh it's the software that came with the device called Echo Project. Uh and that again didn't require any particular computing. In fact, um I can't remember whether I processed on the university sort of desktop computer or on my my laptop but it's um um it does take a little while to to process once you put together a lot of grids but individual grids aren't aren't too bad but um even so it's it we certainly didn't have to book time on on um our uh, um on the university server or anything to do it it just sort of uh, you know you could do it ad hoc so um 
So, uh, it, but it is. It's it's a it's a it's a bit more of a, it's certainly a bit more data hungry than uh, um, than uh, than some of the other processes. But it does produce wonderful images. So it's. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Phil. I cannot see any um, other questions. So I think I um, just need to thank you for this amazing talk and such an amazing uh, work that you have shown and, 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 and really, really exciting stuff and, and seems um, quite useful and, and, and not that complicated to use in some of the techniques, which is nice and which is very good uh, to see. Phil, thank you very much. I would like to thank Diana as well for uh, getting touch with, in touch with you. So thank you for your support, Diana, as well. And thank you, everyone, for attending. That's uh, quite a great webinar with a good number of people attending. So that's really, really nice. Um, thank you very much, Phil. The recording will be made available uh, later in our BCS website. And once again, thank you for your attention and your support, uh, Phil. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.